everybody can if everybody can unmute uh, if you um, if you have a question that was a great first of all thank you for giving that presentation it's an unusual topic actually we don't usually run into that uh, so let's uh, if, if you would unmute and give a round of applause for Michael this is very we appreciate that a lot and uh, we'll throw the floor open here I have one question actually uh, that if if it's a well at Lawrence Hall of Science there's it's a it's a big it's a relatively large organization mm -hmm. part of University of California and there actually is a public relations person there I think um, so in a big institution where there really is a public relations person that's another element that how does the planetarium that's part of that uh, get in on the public relations effort. Um, how is that? How can that relationship be made? Oftentimes, the a public, especially at a at a, a university system or at a college, um, public relations people are writing news stories for the marketing and 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 uh, community relations side, and they're they're trying to tell the stories of your institution as effectively as they can. The problem is, is that when you get to a museum or a, a college where there are so many different stories to tell, oftentimes you get these very superficial, uh, you know, kind of superficial uh, ideas of, oh, this is what this department is doing, or we can push this person or this department or this facility because it looks nice and then we'll get a you know a few weeks out of that and move on to the next one in working with say internal public relations uh at at an institution you're providing them with expert information expert knowledge and anytime you're working in um in media in advertising in public relations and in marketing uh, when you're working in communications in general information is king it is it is the key to it all if you can provide good information that in and of itself is a relationship that's worth building uh and it allows for a level of independence oftentimes that that other departments or other facilities uh, may not be able to tap into you are a treasure trove of information and they can come back to you over and over again for that information because clearly you've done your research you've spent the time that's necessary to understand your place in the community your place in the facility and, and those are the sorts of relationship builders that go a very very long way um, over and over and over again good information and a trustworthy relationship between you and and someone at your institution uh, it will only pay dividends uh, for you and for that planetarium moving forward. Uh, Michael, will you want to unshare your screen and uh, absolutely if anybody has their video on we can see them too when they speak. Um, I guess the other side of that question actually is if you're very small if you're a very small planetarium and you really have, you know, you're, it's a one person operation and you have to do everything. What would be the most important relationships that you could build? Um, it, it would be, uh, you know, if we're thinking about sort of the, the smaller planetariums and this is sort of putting on the, the planetarium hat uh, from just a few months ago. Uh, being at a, a community college in Florida with two staff members meant that from a, on a day-to-day -day basis, we would not have to often uh, work with people. Um, if we wanted to do things on our own, we most certainly could. Uh, and you're not, you're not going out of your way oftentimes to um, try to, to, to fit into sort of this larger public relations campaign that a college or university might be doing. In, in the case of the smaller domes, 
thinking about campaigns in this way and, and sort of asking the necessary questions, what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses, uh, oftentimes is even more effective at the smaller domes than it would be at a bigger one because it's you sitting down and saying, all right, what are the strengths of this dome? What are, what are in a lot of ways, what are my professional strengths? And what are my professional weaknesses? How do those things work together? How do those two correlate to produce a planetarium that's either extremely effective or maybe a little less so? But then it's realizing that if you're at a college, maybe the relationships that you need would be the director of a college foundation, um, members of the board of trustees, the president of your college. Um, one of the great things about planetariums is that there's almost certainly nothing like it elsewhere on your college campus, elsewhere in your facilities. And that means that there is a, a novelty to it that you can tap into. Uh, that is an opportunity. Um, it, depending on how that novelty works, it's either a strength of your institution or it's an opportunity for your institution. And using those and building the trust of, hey, you're the president of our college, you're a member of the board of trustees, we know you make budget decisions, that may be a useful thing, but it's also there very, very likely to be well-connected in the community as well. And when the time comes for you to put together a fundraiser or to do a large scale event, those are the sorts of connections that go externally that have really long lasting consequences and oftentimes very, very positive long lasting consequences. I can see Andy now. You have your iPad switched on. Actually, I'd like to ask a question, not of you, Michael, but of uh, everybody else. Uh, if, if you have any thoughts or recollections or experiences that are related to this, what are your, do you, can you think of any escapades into public relations that you've had? I'm lucky enough to be at a community college with a um, marketing department and a public relations person who does all of our press releases. But one of the things that we are starting this year is to run shows with a Spanish language soundtrack. So that's something that I'll need to work on letting everybody out there know is available and that I have somebody on staff who speaks Spanish fluently and can do the live portion of the presentation. So that's a new direction for us where I'll need to kind of incorporate everything that you've talked about. Yeah, that, that really becomes, a, a, you know, that's the, the S and the O, it's a strength and an opportunity, mainly because it's one thing to advertise that you have a Spanish language show it's one thing to kind of put that in marketing, you know, marketing jargon or putting it on a, uh, on a pamphlet. It's another thing to say, what's the campaign for that? It's, we can go and we can find places in the community that this would be very, very helpful with them. And building that, that relationship allows you to say, well, now we have additional means by which if we wanted to produce a show that had more than one Spanish speaker, or if we wanted to do something that was um, a pre-recorded narration, or we wanted to just, just get an idea of that community, what their needs might be, that's something that oftentimes educational facilities lose sight of, but also a really prime opportunity to build a meaningful, lasting relationship, uh, to say nothing of the fact that when working in a sort of that bilingual setting, um, there's grant money to be had, and there are a lot of, of opportunities for your planetarium specifically that would never uh, be available if you weren't going to pursue this in the first place. So it really becomes the, all right, if we can campaign on this, if we know that this is working, well, what are all of the other ways that we could take this very unique strength and leverage that for something even better? How do we allow this to permeate other parts of what we do and of the planetarium 
like that's it's a limitless well of opportunities there. Hi, this is John. I'm thinking about a contrast at our planetarium between this summer and last summer. Last summer we had the eclipse of 2017 program and the media at large did a lot of our public relations, I think, because we were well attended. Um, this year, there's nothing like that going on. Uh, we have some pretty good programs. Um, I'm wondering what opportunity we missed that didn't carry last year's success to this summer. That that may be the the sixty four thousand dollar question across all planetariums in this country at this point. Um, it's it, it, to you know maybe not get to the public relations side of it right away, but you know it's the the museums, especially I think along the path, who might say, okay, yeah, we're going to compare. 2018 numbers to 2017 numbers and then wonder why it's so much lower and it's a you know at least at the time a once in a lifetime event and now we're you know six less than six years out from the next big one uh it's it is a threat in in, in and of itself you know that's the, the the bad thing about opportunities is that they can be threats as well uh, the good thing about threats is they can be opportunities. It's how we leverage them. Uh, and in this case, it's it's an opportunity for planetariums to kind of reassess and say, we can we can focus on the really big projects. Um, you know, if it's a if it's a large planetarium with a lot of money and a big facility, you know, if they've got exhibit space and they want to put something together. Um, but it's it's trying to identify events during the year. Um, identifying anniversaries, if you will, I think next year, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing is, that's a solid one. Um, and, and if you're not thinking about it now, it's probably a good idea to get started. If simply, this is a really big opportunity for us. Um, we can get out ahead of the curve and we can kind of be a place that people might want to go to uh, and, and, and a resource that can be utilized and that's what made the eclipse for many planetariums uh, so fantastic. Even if you didn't see the total eclipse, it was, oh, our media is coming to us and they're talking to us and they're asking questions and they know that even months out, they can come back to us over and over and over again. We built the relationship, they trust the relationship, they're doing something about it. Now is an opportunity to look and say, all right, we're, uh, I believe we've got a total lunar eclipse coming up at the beginning of 2019. Uh, that's a real great opportunity because it's going to be easy to see as long as you've got clear skies. Everybody should be able to have access to that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, maybe even focusing on events that you, maybe as an astronomer, as a planetarian, aren't all that, I don't, I don't want to say not excited about, but things that we would take for granted. Um, Jupiter and Saturn oppositions this year might be a, a way to look at that. Um, the Mars oppositions, they kind of do their own legwork. It's every two years, it's Mars, and we get that email all the time uh, that it's going to be as big as the moon. And so there, there's sort of a built-in relationship there. But it's, hey, these things are coming up, and they are significant. Uh, and it's, hey, Jupiter is at its closest approach, and it's really big. And Saturn the, the rings are more open now than they've been in 15 years, and it looks beautiful. And it's sort of those opportunities to replace a narrative of, it's a supermoon with, here's something that is equally as impressive, uh, you know, getting people to look through the telescope at Saturn for the first time, that's definitely impressive. Or shows that, that, that kind of hinge on that and in some ways kind of creating that buzz on your own, um, finding events that you think people would be interested in and selling those and maintaining that relationship. So it, the lunar eclipse next year is probably the really big one, but I think as 2017 showed, maybe it's not too early to start thinking about 24. Uh, in California, it might be. Uh, I, I think it might be 40 or 50% uh, in California at best. Um, if you're 
on the East Coast, it's a different story. Uh, although moving from Orlando to Philadelphia, Orlando, we had 90% coverage uh, last year. Uh, Philly in 2024, 90%. So that worked out perfectly for me. Um, we're going to get people to go over there. We're going to go over some major cities, you know, whether it's Cleveland or Indianapolis or Dallas. Uh, there are going to be a lot of places that are going to get excited about this eclipse again. Yes, it is six years out, but it's, it might be a good, a good opportunity to find that relationship now. And, then, and instead of thinking things were really good in 17, we're never going to be able to reach that in 18 or 19. It's, well, maybe we don't need one big event. Maybe we need four or five smaller events or four or five smaller shows and sort of kind of building up this wave of anticipation and then seeding now, hey, uh, 24 is coming. Um, these big events are coming. We, we're gonna be on Bennu next year. Uh, all of these things are, are gonna come up on your radar and we're gonna tell you about them now and here's the information that you'll need. Come back to us when you really, really want to start filling time. And you can do that with your audiences as well. Hey, we've got these, these, these opportunities for you to come out and learn. We're setting them up early. Come on out. We know you're going to be interested. Here's, here's a, a chance for you to kind of get ahead of the curve on that one as well. You know, Mars is kind of an interesting one. Um, I, you know, it's both, a, it's sort of both a threat and an opportunity because uh, it's a threat in the sense that if you try to look at Mars through a telescope, a small telescope or practically any telescope, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> I, I always have been anyway, you know, compare, you know, co after looking at the moon or Saturn. Uh, but it's so in that sense, it's not a, a good um, observation object through a telescope. However, I was kind of surprised at how bright it was for the past several weeks. Mm -hmm. And most people have, uh, you know, it's less startlingly bright and it's reddish, orangish, yellowish, whatever. Um, and so people notice that and they wonder what it is. Um, but. Uh, and also people are told that, well, the closest approach was at such and such day. And they get the idea that it's, uh, well, if you didn't see it that day, you're not gonna see it, but when it actually lasts over several weeks. So that, that's kind of an opportunity that comes up every two point something years that uh, maybe we need to take better advantage of, you know, and link to the NASA programs, whatever is, whatever new stuff has come up. Yeah, and, and some of that is even less about public relations and more about just we're, we're aware of even more of the teaching opportunities, like where, where are these teachable moments as they come up? Um, and in some ways, you know, maybe as a community, it's even better to say, okay, we, we know from year in and year out what these teachable moments are, uh, let's try to redefine some of those terms a little bit. Yeah, opposition's great, and that one day of close approach is really like two months on either side if it's Jupiter or Saturn. And the thing is, is that it, it may be the gateway, and a, a good campaign might be able to be built around the idea of we can get people a gateway into our planetariums, to our events, to our shows, um, and then be able to seed the idea of, hey, come back in two months, We're, we have a different sky, or a, 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 at least a, a noticeably different sky. And by the way, Saturn's still gonna look really, really great. You should come see it through the telescope again, or we should have a, a Saturn show or a Saturn Bay show around that time as well. And, and use that and say, oh, hey, we, we know that this could be a, a weakness of how events get done. Um, the biggest weakness of events in Florida is that it's cloudy three quarters of the year, it seems like. So we're going to show you Mars and it's, it's, you know, it's one of the brightest things in the entire sky, but it's also July and August and there's a good chance you could be rained out for two weeks two week straight. Um, it's, it's understanding that and, and thinking 
then how would we leverage this for, for more and for better moving forward? I think the big advantage with the eclipse and things like that are that you got all the news media working on it too. And so, you know, you can jump on that and ride along. It's kind of hard to kind of get things going on your own. Something like uh, Mars in the sky though, being really bright and then attracting people's attention. If you can let them know there's Mars, come on in and learn about it, you know, and that works. That helps a lot because they got a connection from outside as well. Yeah, if we were focusing on something there was, if we were focusing specifically on media relations, um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's providing them a story already. Um, it's not that they're going to take what you've written or what you've told and use it 100%. But it's this, hey, this is a really good story. And, and you drop the line of, uh, we've been getting a lot of people at our planetarium who have been asking about this. And 99 times out of 100, that is a completely true statement. And that's what piques the interest of the news directors and the, the assignment editors of, well, people in our community seemingly are very, very interested in this. And we have an expert who's able to fill up airtime and, and write something coherent and, and can talk on air for 90 seconds and, and not become a flailing mass of nothing. Uh, Okay, that's something we can we'll, we can utilize, and even if it's that one-off chance, it's still a relationship that you've built. It kind of fits into that larger campaign of well, we're maybe one of the campaigns is we just simply want to build relationships with our local media, mm -hmm. and what does the final outcome look like? We have good, strong relationships where we know assignment editors and and uh, producers at all of the major radio, print, and TV locations in our city. That's a, a straightforward campaign that has outcomes that would be very, very easy for us to check, uh, but also the amount of work that would go into that, the amount of trust and relationships that could be built would be invaluable, not just in the moment, but in many, many months and years and decades to come in some cases. Yeah, it just keeps going. Yeah, it's really helpful. I have a, a story of missed opportunity. Uh, the, yeah, you can get the news media. <laughs> the, the, our, me, our public relations person put out, uh, sent a message to uh, John Erickson and me that one of the local, uh, I think it was TV stations, public TV, I guess it was. Um, wanted to talk to uh, somebody at Lawrence Hall of Science about the Perseid meteor shower because it was supposed to be especially good this year. And uh, you know, neither of us was really available, you know, and th there's those kind of last minute things that come up where uh, uh, if you have established a relationship, you know, the reason they called us is because they figure there's somebody there at Lawrence Hall of Science who knows their stuff. And uh, so they'll call and that'll be the place that they'll, there's actually a few places in the Bay Area. There's Cal Academy and there's Chabot that get these calls too. A lot, Chabot Space and Science Center. So, but if you're not around and ready to take the call, then uh, that's a missed opportunity. I suppose there's also, if you don't feel like taking the call. <laughs> Not in the mood. <laughs> yeah, that 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 is that is very much that is a real weakness. Uh, just if you've done fifteen calls or you know for for everybody thinking back to the eclipse, it was you know if you're on your thirtieth eclipse call of the day, you know <laughs> how effective that that interview is going to be is uh, uh, remains to be seen. But it's. It's one of the things where it, if we go back to anticipating it, um, you know, we can, you can look at a, a, an astronomical calendar for the year and, and you know, if, if a Perseids, the Perseids or the, the Geminids were on a, you know, a series of days where there's a, you know, no moon or something, you know, might be something a few months out to be say, hey, uh, you're probably going to hear about this. You should probably hear it about from us first. Here's some basic info. And if you need anything, when the time comes, get back to us. 
that's a 60 second investment that I guarantee is going to be paying off, uh, you know, a few months down the line when, when those, those phone calls start rolling in, it's, Hey, we've got something, we can send it out. Um, always a great idea to have a quick write up on some of these things. Um, if you've just got a, a document maybe that you've put together about, you know, things to do uh, at a meteor shower party or how to best uh, view meteors, uh, view the Perseids of the Geminids and having that be able to say, hey, I'll, let me just send this to you real quick. I may not have a ton of time for a phone call or I can't come into the studio, but I can send you some information. It's from, you know, it's from me at this institution at least at the very least they've got a name they've got contact info they've got information and i can guarantee you they will use it well that may be helpful this is john again um the call that alan and i got was a sunday afternoon when neither of us was on the site but now we have an email address so before the eclipse of 2019 or something, we can give them a, an invitation. Exactly. You're, you're, you're going to people where they are um, and you're providing with the information that you know because of your previous relationship with them. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a specific person, just with that, that institution or that, that media outlet. Uh, you know what they need. If, if if you're working with a radio station, you would know that you wouldn't have to worry uh, a ton about uh, sending them images. Um, they'd want a lot of good written information that they could read on air that would be simple and easy to edit. If you were working with a, uh, a new station, um, one of the ideas, if you have the time, is take a day or two and kind of go through and find B-roll. Um, pictures of your events, videos that you've done, and kind of have them in one place that you can very easily send out and drop to them. And, you know, in a lot of ways with media, if you make their job easier, uh, that's going to pay off. Um, you know, if you're against, uh, if you're against deadline or you've got to get something out that's a little bit different from the other, you know, three or four uh, stations in the area, Anything that separates that, anything that, that makes it unique is going to help them and it's going to help you stand out. You know, another weakness that comes to mind, that came to mind, that almost all, that most planetariums have is that, you know, is with the audience of uh, blind or deaf people. And uh, that, that's a prevalent weakness that, uh, you know, occasionally, Occasionally, there'll be a group that wants a, a show, you know, hey, do you have a show for deaf people? And then, and then you, if you haven't really set up a, a, a system or a way to deal with that, then it's a real serious weakness. You can't, you're really limited in how you can serve a group like that. Yeah, that, that might be one of the, the best examples for um, cost benefit. And, and the amount of time that would go into finding the right people and putting together a curriculum that would be appropriate for a, a class of blind students or a class of deaf students, the, the amount of work put in at the beginning is going to massively pay off later on. And to be an institution that if, if there's a class, says, oh, uh, this is the only place that can do astronomy for blind students and they do it well. That is a, that's bragging rights but it's also a trust builder. Um, the relationships in that community are very, very quickly going to grow because you've provided something for them. You've anticipated their needs. And in anticipating their needs, you've provided a service that is very, very unique uh, and something that allows you to stand out in a way that very few facilities have the ability to do. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing if you are, uh, building a building and you need to make sure that it's ADA compliant, it's a different if you're putting together a planetarium show and from the moment that you begin production, you're keeping in mind, well, this would be great to incorporate for blind students or this uh, soundscape would be very, very immersive for uh, a, a group of deaf students or 
building shows where at the very least you have those, those aspects in mind. Um, you're anticipating and, and you're mitigating a weakness. A weakness is we can't actually provide something for you. Uh, you've anticipated it and now it's a strength. This is something we can provide to you that no one else can or no one else can, can teach these subjects to your students as effectively as we can. And from a, from a, a building relationships and, and finding opportunities, opportunities usually create more opportunities and, and they continue to create opportunities. And strong relationships usually breed more strong relationships and it just keeps going from there. Well, I think we've gone almost an hour and uh, this has been a very interesting and uh, unusual topic, uh, a very good addition to our uh, planetarium seminar. Thanks again, Michael, for Absolutely. leading this for us. It's wonderful. And then, Alan, I'm just going to go ahead and very briefly share my screen again. Uh, it's just got my contact information. So if anybody would like to get in contact with me, whether it's social media or through email, uh, uh, please feel free. Um, pick my brain as much as possible. That is, that is not a problem. Excellent, thank you. Any last words from any, any of uh, our attendees? Thank you, Michael. You're very welcome. And then for, uh, I think, quite a few of you, uh, looking forward to seeing some of you at LIPS in about 10 days. So uh, looking forward to Seattle in a, a really good couple of days and, and some more live and interactive planetarium stuff. So uh, should be a good time. Well, and, sp and speaking of which, we're not gonna have a Pacific Planetarium seminar in September. Uh, the next one will be in October the end of October, and it's going to be uh, one of uh, profess, um, a person from the Lunar and Planetary Institute giving us a talk about the, about the latest images from Lunar, uh, from lunar Orbiter. Uh, should be an interesting talk. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you all know about that in future emails. Okay, well thanks everybody for coming. Right.